Hi, I'm Peter Hart. Welcome back to FAIR TV. There's a lot in the news this week. Let's start with the election. No, not the one here in the United States, the one in Venezuela. Before the vote, one message was loud and clear in U.S. media. Left-wing President Hugo Chavez looked like he might lose. Now, the polls didn't really support that conclusion, but that didn't matter much to a media cheering his defeat, something they have done many times before. And when it comes to an official enemy like Chavez, you can say pretty much anything you want. Here's PBS NewsHour host Ray Suarez. Yet he's continued to thwart American efforts on a range of international issues, such as Washington's attempt to convince Iran's president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, to halt his country's pursuit of nuclear weapons. Of course, there's no proof that Iran is pursuing such weapons, so it's hard to know how Venezuela might be helping them do so. On ABC World News, anchor David Muir called Chavez a fierce enemy of the United States. The real work was left to Jorge Ramos of Univision. Uh, there is a lot at stake for the United States here in Venezuela. On a personal level, we have to remember that President Hugo Chavez has insulted both President Barack Obama and George W. Bush. But going beyond the personal level, we have to remember that Venezuela exports billions of barrels of oil to the United States, and Hugo Chavez can disrupt all prices just with a phone call. And also, Hugo Chavez is the most important ally of Iran in the region. And even though President Barack Obama once told me that he does not consider Hugo Chavez to be a threat to national security, many Republicans don't agree on this with President Barack Obama, David. So he insults our presidents, cozies up to bad guys, controls oil prices with his telephone, and could be a threat to our national security. But tell us how you really feel about him. Over at the New York Times, we've come to expect a certain kind of pro-Israel tilt. But on October 9th, the paper of record used time travel to make events happen in a politically convenient sequence. The headline that day, Israel launches airstrikes after attacks from Gaza. But if you read the article, you learn that the sequence of events is actually in the reverse. Quote, Gaza militants fired a barrage of rockets and mortar shells into Israeli territory on Monday, causing no casualties but some property damage after an Israeli airstrike in southern Gaza on Sunday killed one Palestinian and wounded at least nine others. Close quote. So, as you can read pretty clearly, the Israeli airstrikes came first. There is an old media template at work here. Palestinians are the ones who attack while Israelis respond. To make that narrative work when reality has it the other way around takes some serious effort. And finally, environmentalists and climate change activists, it is time to join the fight over fracking. On the pro-fracking side, that is. That's the message from the Washington Post editorial page, at least. The paper argues this, quote, those who would ban fracking or regulate it into oblivion ignore the exceptional benefits that inexpensive natural gas can provide in the biggest environmental fight of our time against climate change. Now, fracking is the very controversial practice of pumping large quantities of water and chemicals into the ground in order to free up trapped natural gas. Critics cite an array of health and environmental concerns. When it comes to climate change, they point to one potentially massive problem. The drilling can cause methane gas leaks. Methane can be a far more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So this could make fracking actually worse for climate change, not a half-step solution on the way to a carbon-free renewable energy future. The Post doesn't address this issue, but they do find time to cite a group called Resources for the Future, which apparently argues for an approach similar to that advocated by the Post. The paper doesn't mention that the group is backed by a who's who of the energy business. Shell, Duke Energy, Chevron, the American Gas Association, and so on. Now, a few weeks ago, we pointed out that the Post seemed to sell a couple of its pages to an energy industry sponsor. In this case, there is no such direct conflict of interest. The paper is pushing a pro-industry line seemingly for free. Just another day in the so-called liberal media. I'm Peter Hart. Thanks for tuning in to FAIR TV.